Hello, everyone. Welcome to Authors at Google. We're going to have a talk by Sirs Michel and Paolo Woods on their book, China Safari. I read about, I started reading about this topic about a year and a half ago and got very interested. So when the topic came up, I was, I jumped at the chance to um, present the, per, to host them. I think everyone's going to find it very fascinating to hear about how these two very important parts of the world are coming together in a way that's going to have a big impact on both of their economies and on the rest of the world. Uh, if you've got your computer and you're not on call, please turn it off. Um, and please um, welcome our speakers. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, so um, do you hear as well? Yep. Yeah. So um, my name is Serge Michel and uh, I'm a writer from Switzerland working mostly for European newspapers and magazines. Uh, I've been based in uh, Zurich, in um, Tehran, in Belgrade, and in Dakar. Uh, and now I'm back home in Geneva. And I'm also the founder of the Bondi blog, which is um, um, in the volatile suburbs of Paris. And it's a 2.0 web project uh, about, that employs about 100 young immigrants in France. Um, it has been 10 years that I, I work with Paolo, and we've produced uh, three books together which is the, the last one, and now we are uh, working on a new one about Iran. We've been there the whole month of June. Hello, my name is Paolo Woods. I'm a son of a Dutch modern a Canadian father. I was brought up in Italy. I presently live in Paris, and I'm a photographer. Uh, I've been a photographer since I was 17, but in the last 10 years, I've been working on long-term projects, mainly with Serge, uh, which are stories uh, that have something to do with the news, but is not hard news. We don't work directly for tomorrow's newspaper. We will look, work for stories that try to look into depth in subjects we think are necessary. Uh, the first two books we did before, before this one, the first one was called A Crude World, and it's a story about oil through the whole world for 12 different countries in four different continents. And to see, we investigated, they've actually been an oil-producing country is a blessing or is a curse for its own people. And the second one was a long investigation in, two, in the two uh, wars of George Bush in Afghanistan and Iraq, where we worked for a very long time, uh, both times. So then we have this project. And then we are also together um, uh, publishers of a small, we have a small publishing company together with uh, a third colleague called uh, Claude Bestold, and we produce uh, uh, small uh, travel guidebooks and images to unexpected destinations like this one. So it's uh, guidebooks just composed of images. This one was to Afghanistan. Um, so why did we do uh, the book called China Safari? When I was correspondent in West Africa for Le Monde, I felt that there was a new phenomenon uh, taking place, one that would change the face of Africa. Half a million Chinese uh, had come to Africa, not as missionaries, not as uh, aid workers, but, uh, to throw, but for the raw materials they need to fuel their amazing growth. And uh, we Westerners, we, we often uh, uh, only see misery, uh, genocide, wars, disease and droughts in Africa. Um, but the Chinese, they are going there to some of the poorest and the most dangerous places in the world with a, with a real sense of a 21st century adventure. And they are investing there and sometimes making a fortune. So they, they consider Africa actually as an opportunity. Um, while we Westerners, we often see it as, uh, with empathy as a place for hands out. So uh, we felt that it was a very important story, but that was not getting uh, enough attention. The story is not only about China and Africa, it's, it's, uh, it concerns actually the whole world. Um, this is a bit the accomplishment of globalization. Uh, China is using Africa as a trampoline to become the world's first world power. Yeah. So how did we do this story? Uh, this is a kind of story that uh, cannot anymore be financed by a magazine or a newspaper. New newspaper will send you today for over two years to 12 African countries and twice to China. Uh, on assignment. Uh, so, and we wanted very much not to do a story sitting in an office looking at statistics and numbers, but we wanted to do on-ground reporting like we always did. We wanted actually to meet these Chinese, go into Africa, and, and, and for the 21st century adventure for them, for, for looking for a, a new uh, place uh, for, for 
for the development for, for themselves. So we started in North Africa, in Southern Africa, in, in the West and in the East, uh, and tried to cover all the different aspects. In each country, tried to analyze uh, why the Chinese were there, what were they doing there, what were the specific uh, issues in each country. Um, the man under the umbrella is called Jacob Wood. And uh, I'm sorry to say it here, but uh, before we interviewed him uh, in Lagos, Nigeria, in April 2007, uh, he did not exist on Google. Um, but he ought to, because this man uh, is one of the biggest Chinese entrepreneurs in Nigeria. Uh, he's the owner of about 15 factories there, and he's an advisor to the president, who's offering him a constant police escort. Um, he stands here in front of 544 villas that his company has built in six months for the American oil company Chevron. And here we are in a steel factory, always in Nigeria, owned by a friend of Jacob Wood we just saw. And uh, what you uh, see here is a Chinese supervisor and a Nigerian worker in a not uh, very friendly pose. What you might notice as well is that the Chinese supervisor is wearing protective shoes while the Nigerian worker is just wearing flip-flops. So still, the relationship, the working relationship can be tough, but there is also a real proximity. Look at this supervisor here, uh, teaching a Nigerian uh, worker in the heat of the same steel factory. Um, if it was a Westerner, he would just sit in the office with air conditioning and uh, checking the production figures on, on the computer, and he would also get 20 times more money. This is not a factory, it's a biscuit factory, the Bisco Biscuit Factory. And it's interesting because this factory uh, produces about uh, 70 tons of biscuits each day, which cover just 1% of the demand in Nigeria. But this biscuit factory had been previously owned by British, uh, by Indians, uh, by Nigerians, and it always went bankrupt. And when the Chinese took it over, uh, with their very strong work ethic, they're making it work in one of the countries where businesses, which is not oil, have a hard time uh, flourishing. You know that Nigeria is a, uh, Africa's biggest oil producer. And uh, they, this, this factory now is running 24-7 uh, with two, hour, two shifts a day, two 12-hour shifts a day, uh, em employing a lot of local uh, workforce. So this engineer is explaining to uh, the, the workers, some of the um, uh, workings of the factories. factory. There is a club in Lagos for Chinese entrepreneurs with about 200 members, and uh, some of them are in their early 20s, and but all very successful. Um, here is their monthly meeting in, in a restaurant, it's an expensive one, and the African waiters are wearing um, traditional Chinese costumes directly imported. Uh, this is uh, uh, the wife of Mr. Wood, the man we saw in the very first photograph under an umbrella. Or I should probably better say one of the wives of Mr. Wood, because uh, Mr. Wood has adopted a lot of local uh, costumes, so he has become polygamous as well, as, as also learning the local language and all that. So this, this wife is called uh, Amy Wood, and she is shown here in one of the restaurants she runs. This is a um, five-story restaurant, 1,500 seats in the center of Lagos. And uh, in this uh, particular photo, she is throwing a banquet for the president of the Nigerian Senate, who is celebrating here his 70th birthday with 300 guests. Well, let's go now to Congo. Um, this picture, which is also the, the cover of the book, um, it's a dam under construction. And uh, a dam for which the Western aid agencies, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, constantly refused to, to finance uh, because of the lack of transparency, the lack of good governance, the lack of uh, democracy, the lack of uh, stability in the country. The Chinese were not bothered by these, these uh, shortcomings. And they not only financed the dam, but they also uh, are big, b building it. Uh, they sent 400 uh, workers from China to, to Congo for that project, and they hired about a 1,000 Congolese workers. And to make sure that uh, they know who's who, they have uh, asked the, the Chinese supervisors to have uh, yellow helmets and the Africans to have blue helmets. This dam, when completed, will double Congo's uh, electricity uh, output, uh, which is something which is badly needed if you think that Congo, the capital Brazzaville, only has three hours of electricity a day. 
it might be very difficult to operate a company like Google in a place that only has three hours of electricity each day. So you see that infrastructures at times uh, come before the necessity of good governance, democracy, you know, that in any case in the Chinese vision. Um, ministers in Africa have the reputation of, doing, of not doing many things for their own people, and that is often the case. But China uh, now helps African governments to achieve more and to, and to get so easily re-elected. Claude Alphonse Silou here, you see him, uh, is the housing and construction minister in Congo. And Chinese have made his life very easy. Um, he's also an architect, and he can sketch whatever he likes. They will build it, uh, just on time for the election. And the Chinese will later get uh, repaid by Congolese oil. So here you can see behind these, uh, these uh, people here, some of these villas uh, that the Minister Sulu has uh, designed, which are being constructed by the Chinese company. And these are going to be villas for uh, middle-class Congolese families. Uh, the, the two Chinese here are photographing uh, this, this project, the progress of the project, with their uh, Congolese translator. And these images will then be used back home to raise more capital for investment in Africa. Uh, one of the problems in the working sites uh, in Africa with Chinese is that they don't share any common language. So the only way to communicate is by gestures and not always uh, very friendly ones. And this, this you could say, is a bit uh, photograph speaking about the birth of the union. Uh, these are uh, Congolese workers working on a, a project uh, run by, by Chinese, and they're paid roughly uh, $4 a day. About half of that goes away in transport to get to work site and in the lunch. Uh, the lunch is not offered like it is here in this case. And so they're left only with uh, two dollars uh, and they don't, they don't have a contract. Uh, they're not insured. Uh, they, get, they claim they get re regularly beaten by their Chinese uh, bosses. And, um, and when, if they're injured, they get fired uh, immediately. So uh, there is a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment growing in the lower uh, sections of the population. But still, the, the Chinese um, language and, and Chinese themselves remain very attractive. And here we are in the high school of Brazzaville with students passing their exams in, in Chinese language. Uh, these classes have had to be doubled every year because more and more students in Congo want to learn Chinese. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, they, if they learn English, they will not, uh, they, it's, it's very, uh, the, the, the chance to get an American visa is very low. Um, and if they learn French, well, they speak some French basically, but not very well. If they, they, they will also never get a French visa. But uh, there are more and more visas for them in, in China. And you have a growing diaspora, uh, African diaspora, in cities like Canton and uh, in Beijing. We were on the beach of uh, Pont Noir uh, in, in Congo, and uh, this is uh, some of the members of the family Ye. Uh, the lady you see standing next to the small girl is called Jessica Ye, and she arrived in 2001 to Congo penniless from uh, China. She was uh, uh, working as a translator on a Chinese construction site. She had learned some uh, French, and eight years on, uh, she today is at the head of a small empire that spans from logging concessions in the Congo forest uh, to uh, uh, cement import, from uh, prostitution to a factory producing aluminum window frames. And uh, in the years, she has brought 80 members of her family to Congo, of which you see some of them here. And uh, here uh, we, we, we witnessed a very animated discussion between Philippe, is Jessica's uh, uh, brother and the former owner of a restaurant that Philippe has just uh, bought. The Congolese man came to claim uh, the money for the restaurant and the Chinese man was trying to, to delay the payment. And this is the husband of Jessica, uh, Mr. Zhang, and he is uh, photographed here in one of his houses in Pont Noir. Um, this house uh, used to be uh, the residence of the uh, German uh, council, and now it is one of his properties there. He is at the head 
of the family's uh, login business. Each member of the family is given uh, one business to supervise, and he is the, the, the one taking care of the whole login business. He used to be a journalist for uh, the Chinese um, news agency, but now has gone into the private and is, and is working on them. And um, <clears throat> the family, uh, the Ye family, has managed to get uh, the largest concession in Congo, which is, consists of 800,000 hectares, um, in the Congo Basin Forest, and you know the, 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 the Congolese forest is the s second largest rainforest in the world after the Amazon. Um, and to our astonishment, actually, the part of the family's concession uh, uh, is right in the middle of a national park. Um, so we went together with Mr. Zhang uh, to, to, to that controversial concession. It was an eight hours uh, jeep ride from Pointe Noire. And you here you see one of these trees falling. These trees take about 100 years to grow and about five minutes to be cut down. And this particular tree is supposed to be in a protected species. So we were quite you know, taken back by, by the fact of the, that, that this logging concession was in a national forest. And especially because we had uh, interviewed a, for, for a couple of days earlier the Minister of uh, uh, Forestry of Congo, who is somebody who is very vocal about the fact that he is there to protect the forest. It's a big asset for Congo. And he has written books about it. And so we were pretty encouraged by this man, you know, uh, engagement to protect uh, uh, his country. And so we spoke with uh, the, the, um, Mr. Zhang, the, the, the man that runs the, the um, uh, timber uh, activity, uh, about how uh, he, you know, he had been able to get this uh, uh, logging concession in the National Forest since the minister is so strong about it. And, you know, he smiled to us and we smirked and said, you know, the, the minister is one of the shareholders of my company. And one of the problems the, the, of these logging activities in the Congo forest is that the, the workers are not fed by the Chinese uh, boss. So they, they, and there is no supermarket, no village around. It's, it's, it's really deep into the forest. So uh, the only way to survive is to, is to hunt for animals. So the damage they exert on the environment is double. And during the day, they cut trees, and during the night, they, they uh, kill animals. This is a blue diker, which is not... Uh, a species very protected, but if they cross uh, the path of, uh, of a gorilla, they wouldn't refrain uh, themselves and, uh, and shoot. So here's another case, another worker showing off his uh, night catch, uh, which then will become his lunch. So the, the law in Congo um, says that 80% of the wood must be processed there in Congo, um, but the, the reality is more close to, to 10 to 15 percent. So the, the Chinese, uh, the Ye family has managed to revive a, a wood factory where they do plywood for, for export and it comes actually to, to America. But um, uh, this represents a very small fraction of, of their production there. Most of it, as you see here, is waiting at the harbor for the boats that will bring it to China, where it then will be worked on and then will be exported around the world. Uh, this table here, for example, uh, might uh, be done with uh, uh, Chinese, with African wood, then worked in China. What we have to understand today is that when we see on something written uh, made in China, more and more that actually means extracted in Africa. So we see here Philip, he was just on the picture before on, on, on the logs in the harbor of Pointe Noire. We see him now in a different setting. Uh, he's here in his hometown uh, in, in China called Wenzhou, in the south of uh, Shanghai. And uh, he's on the top of his building uh, for holidays. He's going to spend uh, three weeks there. And, you know, uh, it's often said that Chinese have no right to go back after they immigrate. Uh, on, the only way to come back is, is to be successful. So he, he went back to China with a lot of money, with a, a good car, with a very high um, um, lifestyle to just show off and spend his Afro dollars, we could call them. And he does party a lot. He parties hard with his friend. This is in a karaoke bar, and a friend is one of the responsibles of the local policemen. But he just doesn't, not only parties, he's also always doing business. So right here, what he's doing, he's, he's, he's uh, pr prospecting for the next things he's going to develop in Africa. He has bought a cigarette factory, which he's going to bring to Congo. And he's also starting a business where he's importing spare car parts uh, to Congo. 
So while, while we were in China, we, we also wanted to see who are the simple workers who uh, get ready to, to leave to Africa. So we went to Sichuan province in, uh, um, uh, and we found this, this man called Pen Shulin. It was actually the very day of his departure, so uh, to Nigeria for three years. You see on his bed, uh, the small bag is the only luggage he will take with him uh, to, to Africa. And um, he's here in China. He was earning about $100, uh, $100 a month um, for being a specialized worker in uh, plastic molding. For the very same job in Africa, he will get uh, $500. And uh, this man uh, has never uh, left his province, has never taken a plane, he has never seen a black man, uh, and he's leaving tonight to, to Nigeria for three years. Um, all his objective is to, is to save money there and then come back to China with uh, fifteen or $20,000 and open his own uh, small business. And now we are in the north of Africa in Algeria. This is in the suburbs of Alger, uh, the capital. And this used to be a, a nomad uh, path, uh, as you still see some go through. But behind them, they spread up like mushrooms, uh, um, housing developments uh, built by a Chinese company to relieve uh, Alger Algeria of the very uh, big housing crisis they have. Yeah, uh, Algeria has gone through a terrible decade of terrorism. And uh, the, the, after that, the, the country found itself with a, uh, a terrible housing crisis. So the Chinese were asked to build 55,000 housing units around Algiers. You can see some of them here. And never in the country, the housing blocks have been so high. It's like 15 uh, uh, floors. And it's the first time in, 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 in the country they, they built so high housing units. The Chinese working on government projects tend to be um, tend to live in a very isolated way. They live in, in compounds uh, cut off from the local uh, population and uh, uh, sleep there, are fed there, and this is their lunch break uh, in one of these such compounds. And they will feed the rest of their, their meal to the dog, who eventually then they will kill and eat, which is something which has created a lot of problems in Algeria because this is unimaginable in a Muslim country that you might eat a dog. And a lot of misunderstandings and, and, and compression between the two communities has been growing. Here it's the, 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 the working site of the highway they are building. So you should imagine it's, it's a thousand kilometers highway stretching from uh, Morocco to uh, Tunisia all across Algeria. And uh, the Chinese had uh, only 40 months to, to, to do the work because uh, the president wanted the highway to be finished for the elections. Um, and to, 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 um, make, uh, to, to meet the challenge, they had to import to Algeria about 12,000 Chinese workers, uh, of which you see just one here on the picture. And here we're again in one of these uh, camps where the, the, uh, the Chinese uh, um, live. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very weird place. I mean, it's, it's, these are prefabricated camps which are then uh, moved along with the work of the, uh, of the highway. It's, it's strange because they're almost a, a, a mix between a concentration camp and Disneyland. They're very ascetic, they're very pure. Uh, and uh, even if we had all the government authorizations, the Algerian government authorization to visit them, when we got there, uh, they tried everything to, uh, to refuse us to, to go in, because they considered this as Chinese territory, like if it was an embassy. So now we just moved to uh, Angola. Angola had, had uh, experienced 27 years of civil war. The country is on its, its knees. And um, uh, after the war, the, the country asked the, the, the Western agencies and governments IMF and World Bank to, to, to organize a, a donors conference, but uh, um, everybody refused because the country was lacking uh, democracy and good governance. So they, uh, then Angola turned to the Chinese and they came in with about $10 billion uh, in their suitcases. And they also moved in a lot of workers, of which one is here, uh, doing a very simple work. So it's not very high. Uh, qualified um, uh, work, that just moving a shovel on the side of the road. But the, the Chinese have built that road between uh, the capital Luanda and Lobito in the south in six months, which is uh, very fast, and it's badly needed. The country is one of the most uh, one of the most heavily mined country in the world, and uh, having safe roads is, is is an essential condition for development. 
Uh, yes, and it's uh, not only roads are needed, but also railroads. This is one of the very few stretches of railroad actually still working in Angola, and the Chinese have bid and are are going to construct uh, the railroads in the future. As you see, the ones that exist are in very bad condition, very short, and to bring all the products from the inside of the country to the coast, uh, railroads and roads are essential. And so there, in the future, uh, the, the railroads will be built by the Chinese. Yeah, this is one of the railway that is already done by the Chinese. They are doing three lines all, all at different levels in the country, and this is very important. You know, the, the, we we have gone to the to the center of, of, of Angola, and you had farmers there cultivating uh, um, carrots and, and other vegetables, unable to, to ship them to the to the capital city. So they were not knowing what to do with their uh, production. And on the other side, if you are in Rwanda, the carrots you eat are coming from Brazil by boat. So it, it had a very expensive price because there's, you have so, the country is so rich now. It's the country that had the record growth uh, rate last year, uh, 27%. And uh, uh, the, 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 because of oil, the, it's, 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 uh, it's the second uh, oil producing country now in Africa after Nigeria. And um, uh, so everybody is importing stuff there in, in such a rich place. And there is a long queue for, for boats to, to, to unload in the, in the ports of Rwanda. And this is still in Angola. Uh, this is an engineer on his uh, one day of a month uh, in, in, um, in uh, the warehouse uh, of the company, which also doubles as their sleeping quarters. You can see that behind him, uh, the nettings are covering the bed, and that's where they sleep. You have to think that this guy, he's an engineer. Okay, he's, he's a qualified engineer, but he works for something for probably less than a thousand um, dollars uh, a month, uh, setting up antennas for mobile networks. And these are the living conditions. He, 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 he sleeps in the warehouse. He works extremely hard, very long hours. And it's very difficult to imagine an American company or a, or a British company or a French one would send workers to Africa and work, uh, engineers to Africa and live and work in such conditions. Um, we just had an interview with this man's boss uh, in the office just behind the wall that you see here. And the company is building hotels in the south of Angola. Amongst other things, the boss told us that the relationship between uh, Chinese workers and local women were forbidden. And that uh, if any of uh, his men was, would, would have been caught, uh, he would immediately be sent back to China. But when we came out... We stumbled uh, on this night guard with uh, his female companion cooling off in the African night. And you might notice that the, his zipper is open. And here we go to Zambia. Uh, Zambia, where uh, Chinese farmers are buying big uh, parts of land, cul uh, cultivatable land, where they're going to cultivate on. And, uh, uh, and they're doing very well because the price of food has uh, gone up so much in the recent years that every year they buy more land around them. Here, um, th but the main reason why China is in Zambia is for the copper. Uh, there is a province called Copper Belt full of mines and uh, uh, China has bought few of these new, uh, mines. And he, you see now here the, um, the, the, an official meeting on, on the smelter. It's a 300 million project that China is building a copper smelter with officials. And we, we like the way it, it, it is because it, it, it is very much uh, a souvenir of the 60s when the Chinese would go to Africa for uh, friendship and cooperation, uh, uh, friendship among people and, you know, the, the, the old cooperation. At that time, they had ideology and they wanted to prove that they were the best uh, communists, better than the USSR. Uh, but now they don't have any ideology other than just uh, business. And they're doing a lot of business. Like in this case, this is one of the bosses, one of the companies standing of some of the copper uh, that is extracted. Uh, copper had shoot up in price a lot more than what oil had a, a couple of years ago. And uh, the profits were amazing for the Chinese companies. But not all is smiles. Uh, the the anti-Chinese sentiment in Zambia is growing very fast. The Chinese pay very little, do not observe security regulations, and there have been big incidents in Zambia killing a lot of workers. Well, getting access to copper mines, Chinese copper mines in Zambia, has been tremendously difficult uh, for us. And uh, 
They believe that journalists are all spies or anti-Chinese agents. So soon after the previous picture of the boss on his copper, we've been expelled from the, the Chinese facilities and we were left outside contemplating the, the, the toxic byproducts of the smelting uh, being dumped in the nature. Here is Vivian and her four-year-old son, Jonathan. Uh, when Vivian gave birth to Jonathan, uh, she and, and her immediate family was pretty astonished to see that Jonathan uh, had Asian features. And she, she deeply regretted having had a relationship with her boss in a Chinese restaurant. And she was abandoned by her husband as a consequence. And uh, Jonathan, for the time being, is uh, refused by both communities, the African community, the Zambian community, and the Chinese community. Um, in this final image of our presentation here today, uh, you see another case of a child born from a Zambian father and a, and a Chinese, uh, Zambian mother and a Chinese father. The father disappeared uh, soon after his birth. Um, and for the time being, these children are not well accepted. Um, this one is not even allowed to leave the, the house where, where his mother lives uh, because the Zambian-Chinese relationship right now are very tense. Uh, but because the Chinese are in Africa to stay, um, this will happen, I think, more and more in the future, and maybe one day these kids will embody uh, a new Africa. Thank you. If anybody has questions concerning... Yes. <laughs> Please step up to the... I actually didn't realize that this was the book that I bought in Korea. I was traveling through and I saw this book. It's a China Africa, which is, I think, a direct translation of your original title. Right. And I read like maybe a couple pages of the, uh, of the book. I bought it just to tell you, um, <laughs> <laughs> just to make you feel better. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and you mentioned that there was like an interesting gaze that you had on this particular issue because you were French. Like, could you expound a little more on that? Well, none of us is actually French. Okay. Serge is Swiss. I'm Swiss, but we speak Sorry, French. I apologize. You can guess from my terrible uh, French accent. But uh, no, we, 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 I'm Swiss. But the, the fact that uh, f f f uh, I work for French media and um, uh, fr France had, had colonies in Africa, so, so uh, it's, 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 I mean, the, you can easily go to some places. But the thing is that Chinese themselves have no... Uh, colonial history in Africa. So they are not limited to a uh, few countries where they were the masters before uh, independence. And we, for, for this trip, we went to, to former Portuguese, former British, former French colonies. Uh, and that is very important because the Chinese do have 53 countries in Africa where they, they, they are present in. So just as a follow-up question, do you think China will become like sort of a colonial power in Africa? I, I think it's... I mean, I mean, I because think the only reason I ask is like their relationship with like a couple of their exter like boundary regions and also because you did end the note with like, look at these children. Right. So I just want to... Well, I, I have problems with the, with the word colonial because colonial immediately defines in the minds of the Africans a very specific period, very specific things. Uh, the, Fran the, the Chinese are clearly in, in, in Africa to stay, but the Chinese do not have a colonial past. And differently from the, the uh, colonial powers, they do not come and try to impose their religion, their philosophy, their way of living. They're coming for business. They're very clear, very pragmatic about it. They want to speak about win-win relationship. As you have seen in the presentation, sometimes it's win-win and sometimes it's not. But they do not come with the idea of we are colonizing this. This is going to become a province of, of, of Africa. And, and China. Uh, of China, excuse me. So th that, is, that, is, that is very important that, that uh, it, it, there is a difference. But that does not mean that there are a lot of elements that are not problematic of the Chinese uh, for, for expansion instance, there. The, the fact that they uh, uh, export from Africa, I mean, take from Africa raw materials, they, they process, process it in China and then re-export it in uh, Africa as a uh, finished pro uh, product is a, a colonial scheme. And the French, the British did the same. So uh, uh, in this way, Africans must be aware that uh, they, they, they should... Uh, uh, um, be more, um, ask more to the Chinese because the, the more Africans will, will request, the, the, the most they will get from, from China. And China is also in the learning process in, in Africa. 
I mean, they have made mistakes. Zambia apparently is, is one of the biggest mistakes, and they, they have understood that um, they have created an anti-Chinese feeling, and they are learning uh, quite fast. So the, probably if Africans manage to, 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 to uh, uh, tell their Chinese uh, partners to behave better, they, they, they will. <laughs> yes. You bought it in Chinese? I bought it in Korean. Korean, ah. oh, okay. <laughs> We, we've been very lucky. The book has been uh, translated in 10 different languages. And one of the things I'm particularly proud about is the fact that it's been translated in Chinese, which is not expected. Uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, a lot of people have felt that maybe there was an anti-Chinese sentiment in our book. And I think that our aim to try to be as balanced as possible is a proof that it's in English, in French, in, 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 in Italian, and lots of languages, but in Chinese mainland China. Uh, hi. Uh, Given that a lot of Western governments and corporations uh, aren't investing in, in Africa as much because of security concerns or lack of good governance, do you think uh, they're missing out somehow on, on big opportunities for business uh, as the first part of the question? The second part would be, um, it, you know, ultimately, do you think this is going to be a good thing for the continent? I mean, you have all this money coming in, surely, you know, the Chinese government doesn't care about safety as much in, in some cases, but do you think like all this money and all this interaction will eventually help the continent grow economically? Yeah, let me start maybe from the second part. I mean, yes, I think it will help, not only because China is actually leaving uh, um, good things behind her in, in, in Africa, like infrastructures. Uh, you know, the, in, in the past, the West would, would uh, buy uh, or extract African oil and pay it with money uh, to, to local governments. And it, that, would, that would fill their, their pockets and never reach the, the simple people. Uh, China pays in infrastructures, bridge uh, dams, uh, uh, railways, and that is more useful for, for, for common people. Um, so I think it's good. And it's also good because it has awakened, actually, the... the the, the West. You know, in the 90s, um, America and Europe were a bit fed up about Africa. They had the impression, after, especially after the genocide in, in Rwanda, that there was nothing to be done with Africa. The, 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 the more money you pour in, in Africa, the more money disappears, and, and it will never take off and never develop. So uh, um, Chinese went there and, and, and uh, are showing to, to the Western uh, powers that uh, there is something to be done, and there, is, there are some, some good reasons to go. And now you can see, for example, in, in Angola, many uh, countries have uh, woken up and are like, uh, queuing in, at the, the airport of Rwanda to, to, to make partnerships with, with Angolese uh, people. So the, for these reasons, I think it's good. But uh, um, then the, you answered the, oh. the first part of the question? I forgot what the first part it, of the question was. About, uh, basically, uh, is, the West is, missing is the West missing out? And, and, you know, it seems... Well, it, it, it's, it's coming are. back fast, the West. It, it definitely has missed out. But in times like, for example, you take Sudan, uh, you know, Western companies cannot do business there because it's under sanction. So that was a golden opportunity for China to go in and uh, go for the uh, Sudanese oil. They, they, and, and for once, they were not buying the oil. They were actually producing. They were extracting the oil themselves, the Sinopec Chinese companies were there. And, uh, but more and more, I think what we will see is that the West will uh, start looking at Africa again, uh, uh, not only as a place, you know, good for handouts or good for aid campaigns and, you know, poor Africans, let's help them, but sees them as, 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 as a place where you can do business. And this will happen if the countries have more infrastructure, obviously, if they have uh, more stable, reliable, democratic governments. And Chinese are not pushing for that side. They're pushing for the infrastructure and they're pushing for their own interest of raw materials. But this, the, the attention on Africa is going to attract, again, attention from other countries, as we have recently seen with your president going to Ghana. Yeah, it, se it seems like there's going to be a, a tension, ultimately, because uh, whereas the Chinese government is very lax about uh, safety or regulations or who they do business with and maybe they're willing to pay their workers pittance. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like if American corporation tried to go in there, they wouldn't be able to compete with that. There would be a lot of backlash. They, they couldn't pay. They, they would have to follow a lot more regulations. And so it, it, it almost, you have these corporations which will probably uh, try to do that but not really be able to compete with the Chinese. Right. Sure. It, there's going to be competition. I mean, Africa was a place for ideological competition 
in the 60s and 70s between uh, the, the, the two blocks uh, during the Cold War. Yeah. And I think now it's going to become a place for business competition. Chinese obviously have an advantage right now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Western business can bring other advantages, other excesses that the Chinese don't, cannot necessarily bring. And, you know, many countries in Africa were, after independence, locked in a relationship, in a close relationship with their former colonial power. Like Gabon was locked with France and uh, Brazzaville as well and Zambia with Britain. And uh, this was odd because the, 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 the former uh, metropole, like Paris, would decide everything what was going on in, in Brazzaville or in Libreville. And uh, uh, Chinese came as, as competitors to the French there. And they opened the, the market, and they they are um, uh, um, they, they can level uh, the, the, the the African government, if if clever, can can use this uh, competition to to get better conditions, both from the French and from the Chinese. We've, we've seen that in Niger. Uh, uh, there is a Niger chapter in the book where the the Niger government um, uh, was locked in the relationship for uranium with with the French Areva, which is one of the world biggest uh, nuclear company, and uh, uh, they were not satisfied with the condition the French were giving. So they, they called the Chinese in, they, they, they did as if they were ready to give a big mine, a uranium mine to the Chinese, uh, um, and they, they pushed that um, impression very far, and then the French panicked and offered double price for the yellow cake, mm. and they, the, they signed it, uh, you know, and the Chinese were in this case just used as, as a... As a Perfect, but, but it's, it, it, it's clever from the Niger uh, countries. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last few minutes of conversation seems like have focused on um, Chinese governments, African governments. Um, I was actually visiting Senegal and Lagos in May, and um, anecdotally, I just noticed that in some places, the relationship between individuals and the government was much stronger than in others. And so, especially in the case of the working, the poor working conditions that you mentioned, which, by the way, I, I think is um, is universal. Like Nike has you know, horrible factories in Southeast Asia too. I don't think China is the only perpetrator. But do you think, like, who do you think is best positioned to change that? Like the workers in a union or governments, or do you think governments will, African governments will even be motivated to uh, to lobby on behalf? It's very difficult. I mean, in Africa, cynicism has been a, a way to govern and a, a real a characteristic of, of ministers. So, um, I don't know. Nigeria for example, is a good example because it has a real market, uh, inner market, you know, 150 million people. It's the largest population in, in Africa. And uh, um, th there, is, there are elections, um, um, almost uh, fair and, and free. And um, it, it's a country that is much in advance, and, and they all are also one of the most interesting places for Chinese. You have about 50,000, we, we estimate, 50,000 Chinese in Nigeria. And the, 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 the plane, um, the, the flight line, uh, uh, Beijing-Lagos, uh, was the first direct link, um, air link between China and Africa uh, two years ago. So um, it's a country, it's, it's like a laboratory for, for these new kind of settings. And I, I think... Uh, well, Nigeria has many problems. It has, it has a guerrilla in the, in the um, um, Delta, Niger Delta. It has uh, also some uh, um, um, fighters in the north, uh, Muslim fighters, very, uh, these days very much uh, enraged. But um, uh, I think it, it, can, it can deliver uh, yeah, better relationship for, for workers, be better working conditions. And, and at the end, I think that who is going to make the difference are the African people if they live in a country where the government can be kept accountable, which is not the case in many places. If you have a country which is very rich in resources and the government money does not come from taxes but comes from the resources, the government has no problems in being re-elected because it doesn't depend on the people. And instead, if there is a system where the government is accountable to the people and there is really a vote. It's going to happen like it happened in Europe during the uh, Industrial Revolution where people then were able to pass uh, laws uh, that, that make things respected. In the, in the photograph I showed of the workers where I said there was a birth of a, of a union, uh, those workers actually paid less than uh, the country's national wa uh, minimum wage. So Congo has 
a minimum wage. And in a government project being constructed by Chinese, this minimum wage is not observed. So that's the whole you know, absurdity of it all. So it, you often have African countries that have uh, systems, uh, rules that uh, are, are not that bad, are not, uh, the, but they're not observed by the local power. And well, this will change through the, the effort of the, of the people there. If that answers your question, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. I uh, spent some time living in Africa in the 70s, uh, particularly East Africa. And there was sort of a rule of thumb at the time. Uh, even back then, it was the, the Chinese would build, sorry, the, uh, the French would build your railroads and the Chinese would build your highways. And sort of this division of labor and the two didn't compete with each other. It was all very polite, you know. Both working on transportation infrastructure, but Chinese did highways, French did railroads. Now, that's changed, okay, it's particularly if, if Chinese are building railroads. Um, the, the, my question really is, are the French still in the railroad game? Um, and uh, what, when in the process did the, um, and, and why did the Chinese beat them at that game? Because they really, really wanted to keep the railroad business, at least back in the 70s. When did that change? Well, it changed in the 90s uh, when, when Chinese came in and they, 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 you know, the, the World Bank has actually eased a lot the, the, the penetration of, the, of China in Africa because they have imposed uh, tenders uh, for all projects of a certain amount. So the, the, now they are, the, they are bidding companies and the Chinese always win because they are cheaper and they, they pretend to have the same quality. Now the, the, the company doing the railway in Africa is, is the one that has built this amazing line in China between the main ch uh, center of China and Tibet that goes over 4,000 meters high tunnels. You know, they, they have the, the technical skills to do that. So um, uh, now every time there is a tender, um, uh, the Chinese outbid the, the French and then the French have lost the, the thing. The, the, the French were not able to send a lot of workers there. They, they would send supervisors, engineers, uh, uh, head of project, and then they would recruit locally people. And that has proved to be more expensive than the Chinese method, which is uh, sending thousands of Chinese workers there and uh, working night and day. And you know, um, So this way, uh, yeah. I think from the 90s on, uh, French have, has, has gone out of the railway business. Um, and none, uh, I don't know any project done in Africa, uh, like a road or railway, done by a Western uh, company, except if we, uh, Brazil is doing a few roads in, in Angola. Okay. Uh, one other question, too, and I, I came in a few minutes late, so you might have mentioned this because you were talking about a dam when I came in. But as I understand it, the Chinese at the moment basically are going around Africa, and if, if there's a river, they'll put a dam on it. Um, the, there are a lot of environmentalists who are very afraid because a lot of the places they're putting dams are going to be flooding wetlands, which, for instance, are the only habitat for things like hippopotamus and, and whatever. And the, the thought is that it, there, a tremendous amount of, of, of species, in fact, are going to be threatened if these dams go in. Um, is there any... You know, Africa is sort of an odd place for this sort of thing. But it, but can you can you speak at all to any awareness of the environmental impact of of what's going on? Well, you have you have projects? loads of uh, uh, Western environmental NGOs in Africa trying to uh, protect African uh, environment. Right. Uh, very often, it's it's as I say, it's Western and not uh, African uh, NGOs because it's difficult if uh, uh, you are. Uh, a Westerner and, and there, are, there are Africans living in very simple condition telling them, look, this is beautiful, you have a beautiful nature here, you should not get factories, you should not get roads, you should not get dams, you should not get blackberries, you should just live the way you are, it's so beautiful because I need those photographs for National Geographic, you know. And so I, I completely understand what you're saying and it's a sentiment that uh, we as Westerners uh, feel when we go there and see uh, what, what development can bring in good and in bad. Uh, and Today, uh, many of these environmental um, NGOs, uh, their chief enemy is the Chinese companies. And so it's extremely important that they're present and extremely important that they keep controlling that uh, if there's an environment, if there is a development that is going to take place, can take place along lines which are possibly a bit sustainable.
Mm. The, yeah. The thing is that the Chinese companies do not have are not sensitive to public opinion. They they I mean if you if you take any Western company like even even Chevron or uh, Tex, you know the, the oil companies Texan Mobile, they they would they would somehow feel I mean a, a good article in the New York Times would frighten them to to do a, a very bad project or a project very bad for the environment somewhere. Um, uh, because they have shareholders, they have uh, free press and everything. In China, it's not the case at all. So they, the, the companies feel very free to do what they want. The, the, the thing is that, uh, as for the dam, you mentioned the dam, um, in Africa, there have been, I, I don't know, about 100 sites um, um, prepared for dams, or not prepared, but uh, analyzed that were good for dams. Um, and there is a huge hydropower potential in Africa. And all all the, the projects Chinese are doing right now are projects that have never been financed, but have been, uh, uh, how to say, prepared and, and analyzed before by Western agencies. So it's, it's places where the damage, for the time being, is limited because it, it, it has been already studied by, by the Western uh, uh, NGOs and, and, and companies. The only thing is that in the West, nobody was ready to finance the project, so they, they were like uh, uh, um, on hold for, for de decades, and now Chinese are just using the same uh, sketches and, and doing them. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, you have mentioned that there is a growing diaspora of African people in China. So do you have any numbers about how many people approximately might be migrating? And the second question is you also mentioned that you didn't want to uh, just read numbers, you actually wanted to go there and uh, see it in person. What do you consider the most valuable added benefit of going to there in person as opposed to just reading numbers, seeing stats and basing a story on it? Okay. For, for, for the amount of uh, number of, of uh, Africans in China, it's very difficult to say, but uh, I've seen figures like 10, 20, 30,000 people uh, in the, the, the West Coast. Um, and uh, you have local. Uh, there is a city in China called Yiwu, where it's it's, it's one of the world's uh, biggest markets, and you have uh, kilometers of uh, stands to 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 they, each one sells one product. And uh, uh, in this place, for example, you have uh, two three thousand uh, Africans living there on a permanent basis to ship containers uh, to their homeland. Um, and now you have more and more also students, African students that have uh, that are getting grants to to study Chinese in China. Um, translators are badly needed. We we witness that in in Africa. Mm. Uh, uh, there is a lack of translators that is not easing the communication between uh, the two sides. And 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 a lot of uh, uh, African businessmen uh, will. Not, are not part of a diaspora in the sense they don't live in China all the time, but will go there regularly. So they will go there for in, you know, the containers getting ready to then bring goods uh, to Africa. And uh, um, on your other questions, or, or why, if I understand well the question, why is it better to do underground reporting than analyze statistics, is that if you analyze statistics, somebody is doing those statistics. And those statistics have to be done on the ground in the first place, because otherwise it's very difficult to know exactly what is happening. A lot of things we had read in uh, articles uh, before we, we set out to do this 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 uh, uh, this this book were were misleading were, were wrong were were even racist uh, and I, I think that uh, to make a, 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 an issue like this interesting and, and and touch the reader you cannot just have an analysis you have to meet these people you have to spend time with them and we were spending you know endless nights in karaoke bars with uh, uh, Chinese or in, in, or in, 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 in casinos. And, and that's what I think we tried to transmit in the book, that not only you were seeing a phenomena uh, from a statistic point of view, but you were seeing it also from a human point of view. You have to think that uh, Africa and China are probably two of the most different people you can imagine. And they're brought together not by an empathy, but they're brought together by business needs. And this collision is a collision will be very important for what the world is going to be in the future. And we wanted to tell this collision from an underground reporting aspect. And we wanted to have text and photographs to give you an image of what this, this, this meant 
uh, which what is uh, uh, included. You know, we have been working in, in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Kosovo, in many war situations. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were, uh, one month ago, we were in Iran doing the, 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 um, the uprising after the, the election. And I think we've never done such a hard assignment as this one, because getting access to the Chinese in Africa is very, very difficult. In Zambia, we spent there over a month. And the first three weeks, I didn't take one single picture because I was only trying to get access. And it was door closed, the phone slammed down all the time. And, you know, and I think that's what still makes journalism interesting and, and necessary, uh, especially in a time where the press is uh, living uh, such a hard uh, metamorphosis. Thank you. <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> How did you choose the countries that you visited, and did you consider Tanzania at all specifically? I'll put yeah. the map back on. Oops. Well, it, it, it was very difficult because the uh, Chinese are present in fifty countries in Africa, and in every country they do almost everything. So, it, but we we wanted to choose countries which each each time. Uh, something specific uh, would be highlighted, like the, the, the forest in Congo, like the highway in Algeria, um, like the mines in, in Zambia. We thought that, you know, every aspect of the, sto the story should be covered, ex uh, embodied by one, one place. Uh, yeah, we, we considered Tanzania, but, but um, as we were in, in, in Zambia next door, we, we thought it's... it's uh, so I, I know there are many Chinese there as well. Yeah. And, but, um, and on this... On this uh, um, East coast of, of Africa, southeast coast. Um, there are many Chinese there that have been there for a long time, like a, a century or so. You know, the, uh, when when the slavery was abolished in in the end of nineteenth century, the, the the slaves were actually replaced by coolies, the, the Chinese uh, labor, and these coolies were imported massively in in Africa and also as well in America to to build the, the railways uh, transatlantic. Um, the, the, and you have these communities there living, but they, they don't even speak Chinese anymore. They are called by Chinese the, the, the birds without uh, wings, so the, because they don't speak their own language. And uh, uh, we, we were a, a bit um, defined that we, we, we didn't want to, to, to report on these people because they are not a new phenomenon. They, they are left from, from history, so we wanted to see the newcomers of the last 10 years, and, and uh, they are mostly in, in Nigeria, in Angola in, in Zambia. Thank you very much. And let's thank you. Thank you.